So, unfortunately, the people in Zoom will not hear me. <laughs> I'm very sorry about that. Yeah. So, um, well, it's still great to be back here in this uh, lecture hall. And uh, the first time after one and a half year, we tried to do a colloquium in hybrid mode. So, thanks, uh, mm -hmm. Gunnar von Heine, coming here and uh, taking this adventure with us <laughs> to try the first time um, having a real lecture. The hall is not so. Um, Crowded, that's good for us at least, but we have many, many visitors on Zoom. So, um, Gunnar von Heine is professor of theoretical uh, chemistry at Stockholm University. Um, and he has uh, been director of the Stockholm Bioinformatics Center 2000 until 2006, and uh, then also director of the Center for Biomembrane Research uh, for almost 10 years. And that also shows his topic of interest and uh, the title of the talk also shows what his research is about. And now he's director of the SciLife Lab National Cryo EM facility since 2016 and we are very happy to have him here and looking forward to your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This I hope this is going to work. It's it's nice to try hybrid format. Um, and it's also nice to be back at Albanova. So when we when we started the bioinformatics center, Albanova was brand new and so I actually had an office for a couple of years, um, I guess one floor below here. Um, so it's, but then I haven't really been back, so it's really nice to come here again. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about membrane proteins, uh, and I'll try to give you a, 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 a general introduction to the field and why they're so much fun to work with. and. Uh, some of the progress that has been made in the, in the past few years in a general sense, and then I will, I will focus more on ongoing research in our own lab and try to explain to you how we, we, we kind of th try to use physical reasoning but, but borrow methods from molecular biology rather than physics to try to understand more about membrane proteins. Uh, so that's the idea. And if you have a problem with Zoom, uh, maybe you can watch the video recording after uh, later on which is very professionally made here so hopefully that'll be good okay so all cells in the body uh, of course we're all made by cells and all cells in the body are uh, surrounded by something called a lipid membrane so if you take an organ and you zoom in on a cell this is a liver cell that has been colored artificially uh, of course, you see lots. You see the cell nucleus. You see lots of organelles of various kinds that do various kinds of biochemistry in the cell. Um, and then what you don't see is this very thin, this very thin membrane that surrounds and protects the cell. It's so thin that you don't actually see it in this electron micrograph. It's about 50 angstroms across. But it's uh, if you blow it up, it looks like this. So it's formed by lipids and it's lipids that actually self-assemble into a bilayer structure like this one um, and despite being so thin it's still very resilient so it's very hard to to rip it rip it apart uh, and it provides a really nice protective barrier uh, to the cell so polar molecules water molecules ions anything with polarity or charge has a very hard time penetrating this very thin membrane. So the spontaneous rate of, of, lipid tra of, of, of say, water transport or even worse, ion transport across this thin membrane is very, very low. So it's a really nice protective layer around the cell. But of course, the cell has to you know, be able to, to, to conduct ions across the membrane, take m molecules in and out, take nutrients in, send our things, other things outside. Um, and so in order to provide this membrane with the ability to transport things in a controlled fashion and also to react to signals coming from the outside or even send signals outside from the inside to the outside, this lipid membrane is full of proteins, so-called membrane proteins. That's a large class of proteins, about one third of all the proteins that are encoded within the human genome, let's say, um, are actually membrane proteins. So about one third of the genes code for membrane proteins. Uh, and they have all kinds of functions, but many of them related to transport, like 
ion channels, pumps, transporters that can pump molecules against the concentration gradient, receptors that can, you know, if their signaling molecule comes in the bloodstream and binds to a receptor, um, it can trigger confirmation of changes on the inside and signaling events in the, inside the cell so that you know, can, the outside can affect the biochemistry that happens inside the cell in many different ways. So they are really the gatekeepers of the cell, these, these membrane proteins. And they have, as I said, very, very many different and very refined functions that have evolved over the, over the years. So those are the proteins we are, we are interested in. If you blow it up even further, this is a molecular dynamic simulation, obviously, of a lipid bilayer. So you see the lipids. You see in green, uh, these thin green spaghetti-like things. That's hydrocarbon tails. So it's just carbon and hydrogen, essentially. Long strings of carbon atoms. Um, the yellow is what we call a lipid head group. So these are polar, polar atoms that hold these lipid chains together, uh, the hydrocarbon chains together. Um, and if you just look, liquid in water, and of course this is water, um, so under the right conditions, they just continue to form these types of bilayers that you see here. In order to sequester all this hydrocarbon away from water contact, right? So it's a self-assembly process. Uh, these bilayers form spontaneously. Um, and you can imagine that this is, would be the inside of a cell, let's say, and this is the outside. Uh, and you see that water molecules, they don't really penetrate between these hydrocarbon chains, these hydrophobic apolar hydrocarbon chains. Um, ions even less. They do interact with the head groups because those are polar, but otherwise they don't really penetrate in here. So the conduct conductivity is very low. Except in this case, you do see some strings of water molecules that are crossing the membrane, right? And that is because this blue thing here is a model of a membrane protein that's actually an a water channel called aquaporin. So this is a protein that has been specifically designed by evolution to provide a controlled passageway for water molecules. And many cells have a need to be able to, you know, to, to either allow water molecules to come in or, or go out. Um, so this is a typical function for a membrane protein. And you can see how we can, you know, make give function to the membrane by inserting a membrane protein. And of course, the, these proteins can often be uh, controlled, so they can be closed and opened, and so the cell can control its water permeability, for instance. That's just one example. But this is typically what, what a membrane with an embedded membrane protein looks like. Um, now, it wasn't so clear on that molecular dynamics simulation, but if you look at the structures of membrane proteins, what you find is that the parts that are embedded in the lipid bilayer in most membrane proteins actually form what we call alpha helices. So those are the protein sequence folds itself into a, into a spiral form. Um, and that's what with hydrogen bonding between these, the, the different rungs on the spiral. Um, and so if you, have, if you make an alpha helix, which is a very typical protein uh, structural element in proteins, and if you put hydrophobic, non-polar amino acids, uh, if you compose that, that helix of, of hydrophobic, non-polar amino acids, it will be very stably inserted into the hydrophobic interior of the membrane, right? So it, it will be very energetically very favorable for it to, to insert across the membrane like this, with all the hydrophobic amino acids facing these hydrophobic carbon ta hydrocarbon tails, and with loop regions that penetrate, penetrate into the aqueous phase and which contain much more polar and charged amino acid residues then, right? So, so if you were to look at a sequence of a membrane protein, you would find stretches of hydrophobic re uh, amino acids interspersed with stretches of more polar amino acids. So there is a regular alternation between hydrophobic segments, polar segment, hydrophobic segment, polar segment, etc. Um, and the lowest energy state of this is when the hydrophobic segments are crossing the membrane and the polar segments are facing the, the, the aqueous environment. Um, this is just to illustrate another functional, uh, another type of function that a membrane protein can have. So this is not a water channel, but an ion channel. 
Um, it's actually that there is one more subunit in front of us here that's taken away, so we can look into the central channel where, in fact, you see three, in this case, protective ones. water into oxygen and, 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 and hydrogen. So it's um, so you see all the transmembrane helices. This big complex has, I think, more than 100 transmembrane helix, helices in it. But you also see in these skinny molecules, you see them here, and if you look carefully, you see them all throughout, these little skinny molecules in between the transmembrane helices. And it's actually these skinny molecules that are chlorophylls that transport the excitation energy from, from the absorbed photon towards the active site up here. And the, the helices really, their role here is, is to scaffold, as a scaff act as a scaffold to arrange these chlorophylls in a very highly defined three-dimensional structure such that the energy conduction is, is optimized through this network of, of chlorophylls and funneling the, the energy towards the active site, which is this one here. It's a little, um, it's a, it's a little complex of, of membrane, membrane atoms, uh, like a cubane structure with manganese and calcium and, uh, and some oxygen atoms. This is the active site, and basically for every, for every photon absorbed here, that's funneled uh, for the energy from the left here, and the left here is the left here. And all you need really to remember from the structural point of view is hydrophobic transmembrane helices. That's the key thing that, build, uh, that builds up um, membrane proteins. And so our interest here for a long time now has been to try to understand how membrane proteins are made in the cell. How are these proteins made and how are they inserted into the membrane because that's not an obvious there is no not an obvious answer to that these are very hydrophobic apolar molecules right so if you just make them in the cell cytoplasm as we call it the aqueous phase inside the cell they would likely aggregate and just fall out of solution and you just have crap inside inside the cell 
So somehow they have to be guided to the membrane and allowed to insert in a controlled fashion into the lipid bilayer of the cell. And, and that is the process that we've been interested in trying to understand in the many other um, so, So, every cell in the body has lots and lots of ribosomes, and the job is to make new proteins. And the way they do that is that if the cell needs a particular protein, it triggers, it activates the corresponding gene on the DNA in the, in, in, uh, and there are activation mechanisms that basically trigger activation of a gene. And when a gene is activated, what happens is that a copy of, of the genes of the DNA sequence called the messenger RNA is, is made. So it's, there is an enzyme that reads off the base sequence from the gene, makes an RNA molecule that has basically the same sequence, and it's very similar to the DNA molecule, except slightly different. That's why it's called RNA and not DNA. But it's the same types of, of bases that are strung together. So basically you make a copy of the gene, and that's the mRNA. So the mRNA has the same sequence as the, as the gene itself, and the ribosome now can bind to one end of the mRNA and then start processing the mRNA, moving along three bases at a time, called the codon. And for each three bases, the ribosome, depending on the identity of the three bases, the ribosome puts in one of the 20 amino acids, uh, natural amino acids that make up proteins. So the sequence, the, the DNA sequence, is copied into the RNA sequence, and that in turn determines in which order the amino acids are strung together to form the growing protein, right? So it starts at one end, puts in the first amino acid, moves over by three bases, one codon, puts in the next amino acid, and just continues to process until the end of the mRNA. And what you get coming out of the ribosome is a stretch, a sequence of amino acids that are strung together to make the particular protein that the cell was interested in making. So all proteins are made in this way. It's also indicated here, and this will become important, that the growing polypeptide chain actually initially goes through a long tunnel in the ribosome and only emerges from the ribosome here about 100 angstroms away from, from where the amino acids are polymerized. Um, so this is how proteins in general are made. Now, what about membrane proteins? So membrane proteins, they're made in the same way, except that they're made by ribosomes that are already attached to the membrane. So their membrane proteins are made by membrane-bound ribosomes. And that's very important because remember, in a membrane protein, we have these segments of very, hydropho of very hydrophobic segments that will eventually make up the transmembrane alpha helices. Um, and they, it would not be a good idea to have them come out into the cell, uh, the aqueous, solution inside the cell because they will start to aggregate and so on. So the way this, the problem is solved is that at the start, at the very beginning, when the, when the first transmembrane segment is being made, the ribosome docks onto actually a, a, a protein that's embedded in the membrane called a translocon. So this again, you see, is made from transmembrane alpha helices, but its specific function is to form a receptor for the, for the, for the ribosome and to form a channel that can conduct protein through the, the, the lipid bilayer. So if there are polar segments here that need to go across the membrane, they can go across the membrane through this channel that's in the middle of the translocon. But it can also allow hydrophobic segments to move sideways into the lipid bilayer, to integrate directly into the lipid bilayer as they come out of the ribosome. Okay? So there is this, what's called a lateral gate in, in the side wall of this channel that allows hydrophobic segments to, to partition into the lipid rather than to be translocated across the membrane. And this is actually based on a real structure. So 
you can see the protein coming down here and you can see the first transmembrane helix being just being integrated into the membrane and I think you can imagine that if more more of these hydrophobic segments come down here they will one by one get integrated into the lipid bidayer uh, and the, the polar loops will end up on this side or on this side. So this is the key thing, it's the translocon and, uh, and the idea that membrane proteins are inserted into the membrane as they come off the ribosome. They're co-translationally integrated into the membrane and this is the process we want to understand more about. Um, so here I just want to show you, take a little diversion here and show you a kind of a cartoonish movie about how this works. So here is a ribosome that is making a soluble, water-soluble protein. Here is the mRNA and you can see that it's threading through, threaded through the ribosome. These green things are called transfer RNAs and they bring the individual amino acids into the ribosome in response to whatever codon is, is there from the mRNA. And they polymerize into this, this nascent protein that's now just coming out of the tumor. So here is the until enough of the protein has come out that it can start to fold because even these soluble proteins you don't want them swimming around in an unfolded state because then again they can, they can start aggregating. So there are helper proteins called chaperones that provide kind of a shielded environment where they can fold and eventually when they're fully synthesized and fully folded they disengage from these chaperones and now they're fully functional three-dimensionally ordered proteins. Now here is another ribosome making a membrane protein now. So the first bit here is now a, a hydrophobic segment that will become a transmembrane segment. This is recognized by another factor that specifically binds to hydrophobic segments. So it would only bind to the ribosome if there is a hydrophobic segment coming out. This is a targeting factor, so it can dock to a receptor, the green thing, that is on the membrane. And once it docks, it swings out of the way and exposes this, as you can see here, now it docks, it swings out of the way and exposes the hydrophobic segment that's coming out and allowing the ribosome to dock to the translocon. So this is the picture I showed you before where the ribosome docked onto the translocon and the nascent protein chain with the first hydrophobic region moving down into the lipid bilayer. Um, and here is this lateral gate I told you about. So there is an opening in the side wall of the channel through which these hydrophobic segments can partition into the surrounding lipid. So this is to give you a little bit more of a dynamic idea of how, how this is going on, right? And from here on, you know, the first hydrophobic segment would integrate, and then after a while, the second one would come along, and it will integrate through the lateral gate, etc. whereas polar loops will go all the way through and form connecting loops between the transmembrane segments. So that's kind of the taking lots and lots of experimental data together. That's basically the, the understanding we have uh, at this point. Um, now this is obviously kind of a cartoonish model, but just to show you that ribosomes are, we really know what they look like. So here is a recent cryo-EM. Speaking of cryo-electron or electron cryo-microscopy, here is a cryo-EM structure of a ribosome. Um, so it's 2.7 megadalton, so it's a very large molecule. Um, and in red, you can actually see this growing protein chain. So, so the, this is experimental data, all of it. Even this nascent polypeptide chain that was trapped inside the ribosome to get the structure. And you can even see that the protein starts to fold a little bit down here. So it's, you know, here it's just a linear polypeptide chain, but down here it started to fold. So here is when, where the tunnel ends, basically. Um, so this is really what a, what, a, what a ribosome looks like. Of course, it's all, the atoms are all you know, filling all the space, but, so it's not skinny like this. But, but, uh, but basically, every atom is, is in this structure. Every atom from this 2.7 megadalton structure is in, is in this structure here. 
so this is what one can do with, with cryo-electron microscopy these days. And it doesn't even take long. It takes, once you have the sample, it takes a day to get this. Um, so it's pretty amazing. And this is happening in the cryo and we're going to be in 2015, and it's only five, six years ago that this became started to become available. And now it's just exploded. And especially for membrane proteins, because they were very difficult to crystallize, they still are, <laughs> but, uh, but they're perfectly suited for cryo -EM. So, so uh, there has been a real explosion in, in membrane protein structures, thanks to cryo -EM as well. All right, so, so this nascent chain here will become very important now in, in the remainder of the talk. So, so our take on this has been, <coughs> in recent years, has been to ask, can we, really, can we follow this insertion process in at some level of detail? Can we essentially imagine making a movie of this, you know, the nascent chain coming in, the hydrophobic segments coming in, and one by one in the the to how the COVID region starts to interact with the lipid, right? Once that happens, there is a huge energy gradient pulling the hydrophobic region into the lipid, right? Because over here, it's in an aqueous environment, and now it has a lipid environment nearby, so obviously there will be a very strong tendency for this hydrophobic region to partition into the membrane, right? Out of the hydro aqueous phase into the membrane. When that happens, it will stretch the chain, obviously, and that will lead to an increased tension in the chain because it's stuck at the other end, right? And so we felt that if we could somehow measure that instantaneous force, that, that instantane instantaneous tension in the chain, uh, and follow that throughout the whole synthesis process, that variation in force should inform us about what's, you know, in, at some level of detail about what's actually happening here. Uh, at, the, at the insertion step itself. So our, you know, fantasy was that wouldn't it be great if we could somehow put a force sensor, like a dynamometer, into the, into the ribosome and attach it to the nascent chain and then just follow the lengthening nascent chain and record the instantaneous force here as the protein is being made, right? That was our idea. But of course the question is how do you, measure, how do, you do that? You know, you can't really get an optical tweezer in here, or, you know, what, what, how, how do you do it? But it turned out that nature came to our rescue. So nature had already invented a molecular force sensor that we could just take advantage of. Uh, and this force sensor was discovered now probably 10, 12 years ago by a Japanese group that studied a particular protein called SecM, and what they found was that this protein had what they named a translational arrest peptide. They didn't think in terms of forces at that point, but they just found this interesting segment in a protein that had this amazing ability that when the ribosome makes the protein and gets to this bit at the end that's called, that they defined as the arrest peptide, the arrest peptide has a, pre has a sequence amino acid sequence that is perfectly adapted to gluing itself in place inside the ribosome tunnel. So if you imagine, you know, this, this little peptide has just been polymerized now up there at the top of the ribosome tunnel, and it has side chains that are perfectly spaced to interact with little crevices in the tunnel wall and make both hydrophobic and polar interactions with, with various groups along the tunnel wall. And the, the fit is so perfect that it actually glues itself in there. It sticks there. And 
cannot really be, it's, it, the binding energy is so large that it stops further translation. It just stays there and plugs the ribosome tunnel in a way. So that's what they discovered. But what was clear quite soon afterwards was that there was actually a way to overcome this, this stall of the translation process. And that was if you could somehow generate a pulling force on the nascent chain at the same, at the exact point in time when this segment glues itself into the tunnel, uh, if you pulled hard enough, you could actually dislodge it from its binding site up in the tunnel, pull it loose, and then the ribosome would start translating again, and this peptide would move out of the tunnel and everything would be fine, right? So, we figured this is precisely what we're looking for. Something that would react to pulling force on the nascent chain, okay? So, and moreover, it turned out that you could find these arrest peptides, you could find different versions of them, or you could even make by mutation, you could make different versions of them that glue themselves, themselves more or less tightly into the tunnel. So one would react to a certain level of pulling force, but for another one you'd need much higher level of pulling force to dislodge it. So they come in different versions and you can basically find force sensors that are attuned to the precise force levels that you're interested in measuring. Um, okay, so then we said, okay, w we have what we need. We can set up an experiment where we can use this to actually detect what's going on when, say, a transmembrane segment inserts itself into the membrane or whatever. Um, so here is what we, what we came up with in the end as an experimental design. Um, so imagine you have a protein you have some element in that protein that can generate force. It could be a transmembrane segment, for instance. So the idea would be that when it gets near the membrane, it would start to generate pulling force on the nascent chain, right? But I'll show you it can also be other things that generate force. So then what we do is we take this protein, we now introduce into the protein, we introduce this little arrest peptide. And that's only about 10, 15 amino acids. So and it's very easy to you know, make these constructs on the DNA level, so we can design proteins any way we want, basically, and express them in cells. Um, so let's make a protein where we have a force generator, some, some uh, linker residues, and then an arrest peptide. And in addition, we add some extra uh, piece of protein at the other end of the arrest peptide, so that the full-length protein would end over here, but the arrest if the ribosome arrests, it would arrest here. So now we express this protein in a cell. We use E. coli cells, bacterial cells, and we look what happens. So what could happen? Well, if the force generator, let's say it's a transmembrane segment, if the linker region is quite short here, so the arrest peptide is right next to the transmembrane segment, now when the ribosome gets to the arrest peptide, the transmembrane segment is still well inside that 100 Ohmstroms long tunnel in the ribosome. It doesn't even know that there is a membrane another 50 Ohmstroms down the road, right? So it will not exert any particular pulling force on the arrest peptide. So what would happen then is the ribosome stops here. And if we look at the protein we get, we'll get a short version of the protein that stops over here, right? That's what the cell will produce for us. Then we make another construct, which is exactly the same, except we add a bit more linker between these two elements. So the distance here is now longer in the second construct, this d distance L here. And let's make it just long enough that the transmembrane segment is just beginning to interact with the membrane at the point when the ribosome reaches here. So it's about 100 Ohmstroms away, right? Now what will happen is the ribosome gets to the arrest peptide, but now we have a strong pulling force from the transmembrane segment that's pulling into the membrane, right? And so the ribosome will not actually stall here. The arrest peptide will be dislodged. The ribosome will continue and make a bigger protein, right? It will stop over here. So now we get a longer protein. And we can visualize this by something called polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, a very staple, staple type of methodology that we all use to separate proteins. So here is an example where we have made a protein that where there's no pulling force, so the ribosome stops here. 
um, we run this out on a gel, so they sep the gel separates according to size, and so we see this band here that represents the protein up to here. So that's the arrested form of the protein. And you see that this particular construct, there is a tiny amount of full-length protein where the ribosome made it all the way to the end, but most of it is arrested, right? Um, and this is just to show you what happens if we don't, if we don't have an arrest peptide, we just get the full-length protein, of course. Um, so the idea here is we can measure force simply by quantitating how much is arrested and how much full is full length for any given construct. A construct that has a lot of arrested tells us that there was very little force exerted on the arrest peptide at that particular tether length, whereas one which produces only full length protein, we know that, okay, at that point, there was a very strong pulling force being generated on the arrest peptide, so the ribosome passed through and went all the way to the end. So measuring force using this assay only requires us to quantitate the amount of protein in two bands on a gel, right? So the more on the, of the full length form, the higher it was the pulling force. So now we can make a whole series of constructs where all we change is the separation, you know, the, the linker between the force generator and the arrest peptide. And for each one, we do this measurement, and then we just plot, it, plot the fraction full length protein, that is the, how much is in the upper band, as a function of the separation, right? And if this were a transmembrane segment, what we'd expect to see is that for some linker length, we would see a strong increase in the fraction full length protein, and then it would die away as the hydrophobic segment you know, has already inserted, right? So this would show us, this would give us an, a graphic image of the integration of the hydrophobic segment into the membrane. That's the idea. So we don't need optical tweezers, we can just, all we need to do is to run an SDS gel and, and quantitate two bands. And incidentally, we can, you know, we can make some kind of rough conversion from fraction full length protein to actual piconeutins, but I'm not going to talk about that. But we have a, an idea of the range, ranges we're talking about, at least. That's partly based, actually, on other people's uh, optical tweezer experiments, but that's another story. So we, we can equate this to piconeutins at so, some level. So I'll show you two examples to finish off where we use this assay in two different contexts. So actually the very first thing we tried was to look not at a membrane protein, but at the production of a water-soluble protein. And the idea was that if we have a small enough water-soluble protein, it might be able to fold already inside the tunnel of the ribosome. They looked from the structures, it looked like there would be enough space, especially in the lower part of the tunnel, for small proteins to start to fold. And so the thinking went like, if we have a small protein that in principle can fold, you know, in the lower part of the tunnel, and we make these different constructs again, we make one where the rest peptide in green is very close to the, to the protein itself, one where it's a bit further away, and one where it's very far away. In this case, it's, you know, when, when, the, when the ribosome gets to the rest peptide, this red part is still in the narrow part of the tunnel, so it cannot fold and so it shouldn't really exert any force on the nascent chain. In, a, in this case also, because now when the ribosome gets to here, the protein is already well outside the ribosome and has folded well before that. So there is, no again, no reason to think it should exert any strong pulling force. But if we can hit the right length here, we might get into a situation where the protein can fold, but only if it stretches th the chain a bit. You know, it can reach into a... a a region here where there is enough space to fold, but only if it stretches the connecting chain a bit. That is to, t to say, increase tension in the nascent chain. So we could take some of the free energy that we gain upon folding and use that to stretch the chain, right? So we can take some of the folding free energy and make, and, and make it into um, tension, in the, store it as tension in the nascent chain. And that tension would affect the arrest peptide so we will get more full-length protein for this type of construct, right? So that was the idea. So we did the experiment. We took a small protein, only 29 residues long. It's one that binds zinc, and it only folds if it binds zinc ions. And that turned out to be important. 
So we made all these different constructs where we changed the linker length between the protein and the arrest peptide. And then we had this extra bit so we could separate the full length and the, and the arrested. So then for a lot of different linker lengths, we just measured the fraction full length. And what we got was this red curve. So you see that you know, at very long, as we expected, at very long lengths, there is no pulling force or very little pulling force. At short, it's also not so high. And we have a strong peak at about 23 or 25 residues linker length, uh, which places this little protein well inside the, the ribosome tunnel, actually. 25 residues is not enough to reach the entire length of the 100 angstrom tunnel. And we had a nice control here because this is completely dependent on zinc. So if we did the experiment but without zinc available, the protein would not fold. And sure enough, we don't get any pulling force if we don't have include zinc in this, uh, in this reaction, right? So this was the first time we, we, we really saw that, yeah, this assay seems to work. And we could show that, you know, this little protein actually folds inside the ribosome tunnel. And this had not been shown before that that was possible. So e to make that even more iron proof, we also did cryo-EM on this. So we took this construct at 25 at the very top here. And we said, let's try to stall that chain, that nascent chain in the ribosome and do a cryo-EM structure and see if we can see this thing folded inside the ribosome. But of course, we couldn't take this construct because it doesn't it, it only produces full length protein, right? It doesn't stall because the pulling force is so high. That's when these other mutated versions of the arrest peptide come into play. So we could just mutate the arrest peptide in two or three places to increase its strength, right? So that the pulling force was exerted by the folding was no longer enough to pull it, pull it, pull out, pull it out, right? So th by that trick, we could we could actually attach it in the, in the ribosome, even though it was folding. So the same construct, 25 residues, linker length, um, but using a stronger arrest peptide, which is not pulled out by the folding reaction because it's not, you know, doesn't generate enough force. And then we did the cryo-EM with collaborators in Germany at the time, because this was before we had cryo-EM microscopes at Silaf Lab. Um, and sure enough, here is the ribosome, here is the tunnel, and if you blow it up, you see the nascent polypeptide chain, and then you see this folded, little folded zinc finger domain, which is this one here, and it fits perfectly to the known structure. So not only could we show that, you know, by the, by the force profile assay that folding happens inside the tunnel, but we could also show it by cryo-EM, that we can see the folded, this little folded domain inside the ribosome tunnel. So that was pretty nice. Um, and now what we're doing, oh, okay, and this is just to show that we've done this now for many different proteins. Uh, so this one was at 25, so I think it's this one here is the first one we did, which folded at 25 or so, um, a little bit more than 25. And then we've done it for all kinds of different protein domains. And you see the bigger they get, the longer the linker has to be before they can fold, which is kind of obvious, right? They have to get further and further out to the ribosome tunnel before there is space enough for them to fold as they get bigger and bigger. Um, so we, we understand this pretty well now, where in relation to the ribosome tunnel, protein domains of different sizes and, and shapes can fold. But let me end by, by coming back to the beginning, which is membrane proteins. So let's see if we can follow the insertion of multiple transmembrane segments uh, in, a, in a protein into the membrane using the same assay. So again, you know, here is the translocon, the ribosome would be up here, and the, the hydrophobic segments would come in one, one by one, they would insert through the lateral gate, the next one comes in, it inserts, the next one comes in, it inserts, etc. And finally you end up with a multi-spanning uh, membrane protein. And, and we'd like to see if we can actually visualize this, this series of events using this force profile assay and see if the picture, the mental picture we have is anything near anything like the, the correct one. So I'll just summarize very briefly one, one example here. Uh, so this, we've done this now for 
three or four or five different proteins, but I'll show you data for just one, which is this one here. It's an E. coli membrane protein. It has 10 transmembrane helices. The structure is known. Um, it starts here with the blue one, and then it threads through, and th the red one is the last, the last helix. So we did the same thing. We took the whole protein. We stuck an arrest peptide at the end, and then we made con shorter and shorter constructs where we just moved the arrest peptide further and further into the protein and ended up with constructs where it was right next to the first transmembrane helix, right? And then for every construct, which is every, each construct is a, is a point here. So this is probably, I don't know how many points, but say 50 points or something. So it's 50 different constructs, 50 different experiments, but they're very quick to do. So it's not so much, of, so much work as it might seem. And basically what we see is on, at, a, at a gross level, we see what we expected to see. That is to say that as each transmembrane helix comes out of the ribosome, we see an increase in the pulling force. So here is helix one, it's this blue one, being just the right distance away from the end of the, from, from the arrest peptide, that it starts to integrate into the membrane where the ribosome is at the arrest peptide. So it's about 100 angstroms apart, right? That's, then we see this strong increase in the pulling force in the fraction full length. Uh, generated by the first one, and then the force d dies down as the first loop is, is going across the membrane. That doesn't generate much pulling force. Second transmembrane helix gets into the, goes into the membrane. The third one is actually only this tiny peak here. The fourth one, the fifth one, now things get a little com surprising because we thought that this peak would be the fifth one, but we've actually shown that it's more this peak that's showing the integration of the fifth transmembrane helix. And this is kind of a, a, a vague hydrophobic region that's before the fifth one, but doesn't actually end up in the membrane. And then six is even more complicated because here we would expect one peak in the at about the middle here, but we actually see two peaks that are one which is a bit too early from what we expected and one which is too late from what we expected. But we now figured out why that is. And it's because of you know some sequence, some specific sequence elements in here. Seven and eight are very close together, so the loop between them is very short, and so they actually coalesce into one peak, more or less. Nine is where we expect it to be, and ten is, again, the peak is a little bit before the hydrophobic region, but again, we have pinpointed what's in the sequence that generates ten here. So this is basically showing you, you know, how at what point during synthesis each of these transmembrane helices integrate into the membrane. Um, and as you can see, we, we also see, you know, some are broad, some are, some are not so broad, uh, some are in the expected, uh, in the expected location, uh, others are a bit displaced, and so there is a rich kind of phenomenology, phenomeno phenomenology here um, to explore why, uh, you know, what, what about all these details, right? And you see, the error bars on these points are surprisingly small, except, well, here's one that's not, but other, by and large, they're very small, so, so the data is very precise. And so even small, small differences um, are relevant, are, are significant, actually. So there is very rich detail here. Um, and we can make it even richer because these points are about, the, the, the constructs that correspond to these different points differ by five amino acids in length. So we move the arrest peptide in steps of five amino acids. But of course we can move it in steps of one amino acid if we want to, right? We just have to make five times as many constructs. Um, and we've done that not on this one, but we've done it for certain portions of some of these profiles. And we can get super, you know, super detailed measurements where, you know, the, the, the hydrophobic, the transmembrane segment moves by about three angstroms between two points. So it's, you know, we can get very precise details actually here. So that's um, what we're doing right now. We're doing these membrane protein things um, and, and, and just trying to figure out, you know, the overall picture we th I think are clear, is clear, but we're trying to figure out these kind of unexpected features of these, of these profiles now and what they actually tell us about about the, the integration process um, at, at the level of you know, a couple of angstroms at a time. So to summarize, um, 
I should have said um, membrane proteins are, are great, that's number one, but, uh, but what we have found is that this very simple force profile analysis idea can actually be used very efficiently to follow co-translational processes such as folding of soluble proteins or integration of membrane proteins, and there was other co-translational processes where it can be applied. For soluble proteins, we find that domains that are up to, say, 60 residues in size fold inside the ribosome tunnel, like this one here, but the bigger ones, they tend to fold right at the mouth of the exit tunnel, essentially, because there isn't enough space inside. Membrane proteins generate a rapidly varying force on the nascent chain as they're being synthesized, so the force goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. We don't know if that has any functional consequences, you know, if it affects the translation reaction or something in some way, but there's certainly a, a potential for evolution to play on this fact that there is this rapidly varying force on the nascent chain for when, when ribosomes make a membrane proteins. And, you know, if we do this with sufficient resolution, we can actually discern very fine details of either folding or membrane insertion using this assay. So that's our sort of feeble attempt to, to, to use molecular biology techniques to do physics in some sense um, without doing physics. So uh, thank you very much and thanks to funders. Um, and of course, thanks to people in the lab now you can tell this is a pre-pandemic picture, so, uh, uh, so these are not all left in the lab anymore, but, uh, but they have all contributed in various ways to this force profile analysis project. And here is a new recruit that, wasn't, that came during the pandemic. So uh, he, he had actually done the, the cryo-EM structure you saw with the red nascent chain is, is, is his recent work here. So, uh, And finally, I, I cannot restrain myself from showing you a, for those of you who really got sold on membrane proteins here, um, we're just coming out with a book in January that has, if you look at this picture and try to figure out how long ago it was taken, <laughs> uh, you realize that it takes a long time to write the textbook, but, um, but this is what, what we have been playing around with for, uh, in, you know, spare, spare moments for the past 10 or 12 years. So, and it's just finalized now. So coming out in January. Thank you so much. <laughs>